Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and I know what you're probably saying, where's the family in this? But we're just going to read a few verses in the book of Matthew chapter 24. Someone, they have asked the Lord some questions. And that's what we want to look at, and then we're going to be moving on. Matthew 24, we're going to read just the first four verses. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in of the end of the world? Now Jesus is going to answer. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And as far as we're going to go there, take heed. You need to be aware. You need to be watchful. You need to know something. They're out to deceive you. Amen. Before he even, now he does answer the questions. He'll, he'll spend that whole chapter. A lot of things our Lord taught them. But before he even started, you better be careful. There are some out there that you know what they will do? They will lie to you. Deceive you. Yeah, I can't believe that. Oh, I, I, if you're like me, you can believe it because no doubt, if you live long enough, you know what's happened to you? Somebody has deceived you. Unless you was born yesterday. Have you ever been took it in? Been there, done that. That is terrible. That is an awful feeling to be deceived. I'm not going to go into no big details, but there's more than one time I've been deceived. But when we get deceived, we need to learn from it. Um, it ain't good to be deceived, but you can be deceived and overcome it, learn from it, and don't do it again. I can tell you one time, me and my wife, and I'm going to take the full responsibility, it was my fault. It was my fault. We went up to the mountains. Had a wonderful time up there. And, uh, we spent about four or five days. And we were some, I think it was, if I ain't mistaken, maybe the Comedy Barn. I don't know if any, any of y'all ever been up there. But I think we was in front of the Comedy Barn. And there was somebody came there. You know what? Tomorrow morning, if y'all get up early, y'all can go to this place and, and get a free meal. Sounds pretty good to me. I like to eat. He said, you ain't got to buy nothing. All you got to do is show up and listen to them talk for just a few minutes and eat your meal and then you're on your happy way. I said, man, that sounds good. Me and her, we went there. We went in there and had eggs, bacon, scrambled eggs, sausages. I mean, they fed you well. Good meal. Then comes the sale pitch. I ain't going to buy nothing they have. But you know he got to talking about how good it was. He did. And the more I sit there, the more I listen, I said, you know what? This sounds pretty good. Really, I had no intention of buying nothing. Really, I went there and said, we ain't going to get nothing. We're going to eat and we're going to leave. And before I left, I done bought the whole thing. <laughs> he made it sound so good. And even the next day, they called me. Are you happy? Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. I believe you. You know, he told me what I was going to do is going to invest something we can enjoy every year. And then after a few years, it won't even be available and people be wanting it so bad. You can invest it. You can sell it. You can trade it. You will just have something that's worthwhile. I said, well, you know what we'll do? We'll use it for a few years. We get tired of it. Hey, I don't mind making a little bit of money to you. I'll just take it and I'll just sell it. You know, that sounds like something I, I can handle that. You know, after a few years, we got tired of it. We didn't go no more. My wife, her mother got 
uh, 24-7 care, so she had to stay with her seven days a week. So we just didn't even go on vacations no more for a period of years. You know, I said, you know, we're wasting it. We ain't doing nothing with this thing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do, like you said, we can, we can turn around and sell it. Long story short, you can't sell it. I found that out. And it, it gets worse than that. I got on the phone and I was talking to him. I said, you know what I'll do? I'll give it to you. I bought it for several thousand dollars, but you know I'm such a kind-hearted person. They have a maintenance fee you have to pay every year. They want that every year, every year, every year. But you know what? That out of kindness of my heart, you know what I'm going to do for you? I know you got some family. You got to have some children, grandchildren, somebody. You just send me the papers. I'm going to sign it over. I'm going to give it to you, and you give it to whoever you want. We don't want it. We don't want it back. What do you mean you don't want it back? I mean, ain't it worth something? No, we don't want it. It's yours. Anyhow, thank the Lord. After a few years or something, an attorney from up yonder, and you know, they, they always own you, calling you all the time. But attorney called, and I talked to him. I said, and I told him the truth. I said, I ain't going to keep it. I don't want it. And I told him the same thing I told everybody else. I said, all you got to do is send me the papers. I'll sign off of it. Y'all can have it. I told that attorney, you can have it. I said, I'll offer you the same deal. He said, sir, you, you're right. I'm just going to send you the papers. All you got to do is sign in. You read it. It'll tell you you're just released of everything, and you're giving that jump back to them. That was their attorney. I did that and never heard another word from them. Bottom line is, I thought it sounded good, but I was deceived. I overcome it. That was just money. Of course, at that time, you, know, you hate to lose anything. But you know what I'm saying? But you know, there's people being deceived that cost way more than just some money. Some people are being deceived. It's going to cost them eternity away from God because they're deceived. Our Savior does not want nobody to be deceived. So take heed. Don't let nobody. Let no man deceive you. Now where we're going is back in the book of Genesis chapter 1. If we're going to look at the family, we got to go back to where? The beginning. In Genesis chapter 1. Now the way this here taken heed, let no man deceive you. The world we live in. Society. The school system. They don't believe and teach Genesis chapter 1. They don't believe Genesis chapter 2. They might believe just certain parts of the Bible, but they don't want you to go back to the beginning that God created. No, you can't go there. If God created it, then we're answerable to Him. He's sovereign. So they deny the creation. How long has this been going on? Ever since Adam sinned, Satan has been lying to people and deceiving them. If we are not watchful and prayerful and look to God, don't think you can't be deceived. If you stay in your flesh and yourself, you can get deceived. So Satan's been doing it a long time. And I was thinking back, you know, Back when I was just a young boy in the school system, they didn't want us to believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I can remember to this day those school books we had. You could turn to them pages. You know what they taught? Evolution. The theory of evolution. I can remember the pictures to today. Had the picture of a man looked like a, sort of like an ape, and he just kept changing. It had about four or five pictures of him evolving, evolving. And then you know what? After a while, he was a man. Think about that for a moment. That's in our education system many years ago, teaching our young people. Something so stupid. I mean, can you even start believing that junk? 
I was a young boy at that time, and you know, whenever I read it, I just knew the truth. I did. I said, this is a bunch of junk. I knew good and well that was a lie. You know why I knew it was a lie? I've been taught it was a lie. My parents knew better than that, and I believe my parents. Even the preacher, he wasn't my pastor, and I wasn't been born again then. I was just a young little lad, but I listened to him. I believed what he preached, and I believed him. Even as a lost person, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Even as a lost person, I believe Jesus came and died on the cross and all that. There came a time I saw my need of him as my Savior, and that's different. But I've always believed, and when they taught that junk in the school, I said, huh, that's a lie. That's devil in his lies. Take heed that no man deceive you. If we're not careful, we'll think education, and we need education. We need to be taught some things. I think we need to be taught math, English, the correct history. There's a lot of things we need to learn. But that garbage they put in there, we as parents... We better be teaching them the truth. Now that was just about the creation and about where man came from. Satan don't stop, does he? We'll, we'll look at it a little bit more. But let's go in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. Do you believe that? In the beginning that God created it. It's amazing, Genesis chapter 1. How many verses are in Genesis chapter 1? 31. You know he really just deals with it in Genesis chapter 1? Tells how he created it, the seven days. A little bit in chapter 2, just a few verses. And then in chapter 2, he just goes into more details back to chapter 1 on how he did it. One chapter. God does not have to try to explain nothing. I like it about God. He just says it. This is what I did. When you think about the creation, I know we're not on the creation. We're going to get to the family in a minute, just a little bit. In the creation, do you realize how many books that God could have written on the creation? I believe this world could be full of books. And if you could read every one of them, if it took you a trillion years to read it, you wouldn't even begin to understand what God did in the creation. Amen. It's so complex. There's no way. But God don't have to do that. He don't have to. All God has to do is, this is what I said. And, and, and just listen to this here. In verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, and God said. And then we move over to verse 6. And God said. Verse 9. And God said. Verse 11. And God said. And then in verse 14. And God said. We get down to verse 20. And God said. We get down in the sixth day on the verse 24. And God said. Every time he said in God said, he said, just let. God said it. Really, the bottom line is when we read that God said it, end of the subject. Now we can ponder about it, study about it, and like to consider all about it. This little book of Genesis chapter 1, there is so many people that's got so many different ideas about it. And that's okay, as long as it follows in line what God said. Amen. That's really what you got to believe is that God said it. He spoke it, and it was done. The Creator. Amen. God, the Creator. I love it all, but on, on every day, you know, and I, I believe this here. Every day was an evening in the morning. Why do I believe that? Well, you can read it. That's what he said. I don't think every day was a million years or something like that. I believe it was actually a day. 
the evening. Their day starts in the evening and then the next day in the morning. But when you get to that fourth day, I, I just love that fourth day because I, I'm amazed of the heavens, the stars, the galaxies, the sun, the moon. It's, it's so amazing what God did. Now, I mean, I think before really man had the technology that we have now, we could go out on a winter's night and go look into the sky. And You ever just look up there in the sky on a clear night and you see the stars? It seems like they just sing out to you. When you behold that, you ever do that? I do. I go out there at night. and I don't know something about wintertime. The stars would seem like a little bit closer that you can almost touch them. It's different in the wintertime. I've been out there at night so clear and see all the stars, and I look up there and I say, wow, what a big bang. Is that what you say? No. I don't say that was a big bang. I said, look what God did. This is the glory of God, His creation. It's so marvelous. And that's what we can only see with our eyes. But now since technology, you know, they sent the Hubble up in space and it goes way out there. I don't know where it is now. It's way out there. It may be maybe still going. I don't know. But it takes them pictures, sends it back to earth. You ever see these, some of these pictures? You know what they are to me? Breathtaking. Breathtaking. And really, when you look at all these here galaxies, all these universes, and the way they are all designed, you know what they look like to me? Something that's in perfect order. It don't look like chaos to me. Does it to you? I look at it and say, wow. My God did that. In creation. That was the fourth day. But wait a minute. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of stars and galaxies and universe. Man can't number them. They can't even see to the end of it. How many you reckon that is? Listen, do you really think God could create all that in the fourth day? You think that? That's what he said. That's what I believe. Now, if God could create all that in the fourth day, when we get to day six, there ain't going to be no trouble. We just got to believe that God said it, and it's so. That's what happened. So, uh, listen, we serve a God that's almighty, all-powerful. You say, well, Brother Mark, I just don't understand it. Well, join the club. Do I understand Genesis chapter 1? I'll tell you in a heartbeat, no, I don't. But I believe every word. Matter of fact, this, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 2, 22, verse 21, I believe every bit of it. Every bit of it. I don't understand a lot of it. But I believe it. Because you know why? God said God said, see, this ain't a book written by men. Now, I know God had men pin it down. I believe these first books was penned by Moses. But they was inspired by God. It's the holy word of God. So when it says that God said it, just say, I believe it. I believe it. We're going to jump down now. To verse 24. All, this, all these different days, they're wonderful to study and look at. And, and what I like about everyone when he got through on every day, you know what it said? And it was good. It was good. Everything that God does is good. His creation is good. There's no flaws in it. What a perfect world this was. But then we get to day six. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Here we have the animal life. You say, well, there's a lot of animals, ain't there? There are. 
That ain't no problem for my God. I was talking to someone because I've been studying some of this and I was asking him, he works with me. I said, you ever thought about that day six? You know, a lot happened on that day six. He said, yeah, I have, a, I have a hard time believing all that happened on day six. I said, why is that? This ain't nothing for God. Now for us, yeah, this would be a problem. Doing all this on day six, but not for God. You know, all, all the animals, you know, the evening starts, the new day. So maybe that new day, a couple minutes, all the animals was created. What I'm going to do, I got the whole day left. It don't take God a long time to do something. He's all powerful. Don't put God in your box. No, he won't fit. He's greater than that. Our Nothing is impossible with our God. So he created all the animal life. Every, every one of them. What a wonderful thing. And you know what he said? It was good. Amen. Now just think about day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And when we ain't through with day six, where's all this going? Why did God do all this? Did he need something to do? Did he get bored? No. It was already before even the creation beginning. God had a plan. Amen. And God is working toward what he knows he's going to do. Amen. And I'm talking about God. I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God knew where they was going. Not a doubt about it. So what is he doing? He's getting everything ready. Everything ready for the latter part of day six. Now that's what we're going to get to. In verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Now this is different. In all his creation, all the animals and the sea life and all that, let it be. This is going to be different. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let us. And God said, Let us. Who is he talking to? He ain't talking about Adam. Adam ain't been created yet. I don't believe he's talking about the angels. They are not in his image, but man is going to be in the image of God. He, I believe he's talking to the, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God led us. They really, in Genesis chapter uh, verse 1 and 2, you can see the Trinity of the Godhead. And you're going to see it again here, led us. God has never been alone. There's always been the three in the Godhead. Always. Well, how far back does that go? Eternity. No beginning. That's one of them big ones. I don't understand that. Me neither. But I believe God always has been eternal. All three that makes up one. But then they said this. Let us now. I think, I think what he was saying now, we've done got everything else ready. Let us make man now. In our image. Our likeness. I ain't going to go into all the detail. What do we think some of that means? But you know God is eternal. When he makes man, you know what he is? He's like God. He's eternal. Man will live eternally. Man will never die. Now, we know at this point in time, man will live eternity. Man always going to live eternal somewhere. Not everybody's going to have eternal life. Some are going to have an eternal existence in a place separated from God because they refuse to believe in God. But God made man eternal. Always will be. He's eternal. Made in his likeness. We fellowship with him. We can talk with him. There's a communion between God and man. Now, I know God can speak to the animals and tell them to do anything he wants to, 
But listen, the relationship with man than everything else is different. It's different. Man is in the image of God. Now, we're just going to jump in Genesis chapter 2 where it gives us a little bit more information on this here day 6 when he made man. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He formed him. Now, on all the other creation, he said, just let it be. He just spoke it. All he had to do was speak the word. But when it comes to man, God got personal with it. He formed it. I don't know. It's sort of that form is like Jeremiah with the potter in the clay. You know what the, the potter does with the clay? It molds it. It forms it just perfectly the way he wants it. God formed man. So but God's a spirit. I know, but he's saying it way we could understand it. Now, I know God didn't have to have some hands in the dust. And, but listen, it was just as real as it, if he did it that way. God formed him in every detail. But what did he form, out, form him out of? Dust. Dirt. That's who we are. So it ain't this really body. It's the eternal person in man. Really, we're just dirt. You know, I tell you what, you can wash yourself, take a bath, and try to clean up, put on a white shirt. You know what? After a while, the collars are going to be dirty. It can't help it. You're putting a white shirt on dirt. That's what we're made out of. We're formed out of the dust of the earth. But we're formed in the wonderful image of God. He formed man. He breathed into man. And he became a living soul. Man is a what? A three-part being. Spirit, soul, and body. The trinity of God. I know there's some people that love and I, 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 I respect that. You, you love animals. and Some of them, they, they love their animals just about as much as they love their children. That don't take nothing I say. I, I preach Sunday something about some animals and birth and stuff. I think you made some of them upset. I, say, I, I hope not. But animals, dogs, cats, whatever you got, you may have a bird that you just love dearly. Know where it says in all the creation, as splendor and as glorious as the animals are, that animals live eternally. I know I heard some say, well, I hope they do. The Bible don't say it. You know what I'm going to stick with? God said, I know man is in his image and he never dies. The other, I believe God spoke, and we are to enjoy them while they gives us here on this earth. So the animals, I'll leave that alone. Do what you want with your animals. <laughs> I do with mine. <laughs> you cold, I know some people think I'm cold-hearted <laughs> when it comes to animals. Anyhow, God for man. Let them have dominion. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. So now, let us make man, and the Lord gets personal with it. He forms us. He speaks into man. He becomes a living soul. Of course, we're to have dominion. Let's get to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I give in you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, and to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. 
and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, I mean, for us to get a little bit more clarity on what happened on that sixth day, he don't go into details here, but he does in Genesis chapter 2. And we're just going to touch on it just a little bit. Remember he created all the animals? Let's go back and see. Let's just pick up in Genesis chapter 2. We're not going to deal with the part about the warning and about the trees and all that. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But in verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and all the fowls of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a hate help meet for him. Just pause here for a moment. And the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. You think God just now realized that? He knew all along. He said, well, want Adam to know it. God knew that. God knew because God's never been alone. I don't want man to be alone. I knew what God, God knew what he's going to do. But Adam, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to cause all the animals to come before you and you just give them their name. I believe this here. Now, Adam had never seen. God created him. I believe there's probably never been a smarter man on this earth than Adam. I really, I believe this man had the intelligence because God gave it to him. Adam didn't have to involve over millions of years and finally figure some stuff out. Let me sort of dwell on this long, tall thing that's standing before me. Let me see if I can come up with a name for him. It may take me a few years. No, I believe as they came in front of him, that giraffe came in front of him. You know what he said? That's a giraffe. Elephant. I believe Adam could just name him like that. Wow! He was intelligent. God didn't create a dummy. He hadn't been marred by sin. Now, I ain't saying he was the wisest man. I said the most intelligent man. Because the Bible says Solomon was the wisest man that was born of a man and woman. Jesus Christ is wiser than all, but his father was the heavenly father. But Adam was smart. Named all the animals. I don't know how long that took, but God can take care of that. That ain't no problem for God. And when he got through, Adam realized something. The animals, they have a pair. I'm alone. I don't have nobody. It opened up his eyes. Here I am. I got all this. I got the garden. I got everything that God's given. All the trees. All the, And you know when God created a tree, let me just throw this in, when he created all the trees, God didn't plant a little bitty twig. Now we're going to see if it can grow up and do something. Not my God. When he created the apple tree, you know what he done? He created an apple tree that was loaded down with apples. He created the trees yielding the fruit. It was already ready. God made this here garden for Adam, prepared for him, ready for him. He furnished him with everything he would need. Adam had no excuse. We don't neither. Adam had a work to do, but God provided it all for him. God's given us the work. But listen, God has provided everything we need in this life. Don't think that you've been left out. God's given you what you need. He gave Adam everything except now Adam realized, I don't have a mate. I don't have nobody that's suitable for me. So what is he going to do? He ain't going to do nothing. God's going to put him to sleep. Adam don't even know what he needs. He just knows he ain't got nobody. I love this here that God calls him to go into a deep, 
<laughs> deep, <laughs> a deep sleep. Let me get over my silliness. He put them to sleep in a deep sleep. Never felt nothing. You know what he did? Open up his side. And then took a rib of flesh. Sold it back up. Never seen nothing. I don't believe you could see nothing there. I, you know, I, really, I don't believe you could see no scars. When Adam woke up, I don't believe he felt nothing. It's just like a, I like to have someone like that doing surgery on us today. Whew. They can learn something from God, but they can't do what God can do. But anyhow, he done the surgery, took the rib, made he a woman. And then what did God do? What did he do? What did God do? When we get married, most of the time you have the bride. No, you have the groom standing up here. Poor fellows, <laughs> all along. He is, he's just standing up there, he looks lost. That to try to help him out a little bit, they put a few best men around him, but that don't help. But wait a minute, the doors open up. What happens? The father. If he's living, the Father brings him a wife. Why do you think we do that? We didn't come up with that. God came up with that. We're following what God did. He brought Eve to Adam. He brought her to him. Here's your wife. You know what Adam did? I don't know, he don't say, but I believe he stood there and said, Wow! This is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. His name was Ish. She's going to be Isha. She's my wife. Why don't we have marriage? Man didn't think of it. Why is man not alone? Man didn't think of it. God gave man a wife. Why he would do that? Because already in the plan is to replenish, is to fill this earth to bring in the Messiah one day where we can be born again, hear the gospel, and then one day Christ is going to have his bride. It's really a picture of what God's going to do for all eternity. But he does it through the simple thing of Adam bringing him a wife. He was meat for her. Now, we'll, we'll look at it in the next studies. Our beliefs on what the wives are to be is way off base. Unless you've been studying the Word of God and you realize way, the way we should treat them and love them and nourish them and provide for them and be responsible for them. And we'll go through that later. But Eve, she had a man. Given by God. I believe this first man and wife, things are great. How greater can it get? God provided them a house in the Garden of Eden, gave them everything they need, gave Adam a commandment, and we ain't going to go much further than that. He gave him something to do. We'll talk about that later, about the work. There's a work that we have to do. He didn't make man all right, Adam, this is what I want you to do. Lay, lay around in the garden. Take it easy. You have everything you need. You don't need to do nothing. God has never been one that wants us to be idle. You know, God works. And I just throw this. We'll probably talk about it again later. But you know, when Jesus came to this earth, you know what he did? That was the busiest man that ever walked on this earth. He went about every day doing good. Healing the miracles. He will work from can up to can't down. And then after that, go into the garden and pray and then teach. There had been nobody. I used to be amazed. And I, oh, I don't want to get in politics. But I'm going to say it anyway. I used to be amazed whenever they would talk about President Trump that long hours. He would get up so early and spend all the day. He would, he would just go and go and go and go. And he'd go to these rallies, speaks for hours, go to another one, speak for hours. I said, he needs to learn not to talk so much. But anyhow, I was amazed. Say what you want. If you like him or if you don't like him, that man went. He was busy. He was doing. 
He couldn't compare to what our Lord did. Our Lord was one that he worked. And he told his people, work while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. Adam had to work in the garden. But they was in the paradise. And everything was nice. God had provided everything. And then we'll talk about what happens next time we come. It was perfect, but we'll leave that alone. There's so much I like to even go in. And you like to sort of go ahead and get into it, but we'll leave it alone. If you will stand and we'll bow, we'll close out with a word of prayer. Let's bow together. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for being my heavenly Father. Through Jesus Christ, the Savior who came, lived that perfect life, died on Calvary, shed his precious blood. And all we had to do was believe and trust in him. And you gave us eternal life. It's through his name that I bow and can call you my Father in heaven. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for this church, each one who's put forth the effort. I know in the middle of the week, a lot of times we're busy and we have to work and uh, we have to put forth that special effort to come. But I'm so glad for each one who came to hear your word. We need to hear from you. We need to know what you said. And we need to live by it. And oh, I pray for the young children here. I do pray for them. Help us, Lord, as parents and mothers and churches and elders that we can teach them everything that you said in your word. They need you. They need you in this world we're living in. And I'm so glad that you're able to help them in their journey of life. I pray you bless us as we leave here. May you receive honor and glory and forgive any mistakes in the message. I do pray. In Jesus' name, amen.